Hello and welcome to the final show in this series of Consciousness Central, coming to you from the Science of Consciousness Conference 2016 here in not so sunny Tucson, Arizona. Welcome. So my next guest is Dr. Robin Carhart-Harris. He is a research fellow at Imperial College in London, and his uh, specialization is in the field of uh, neuropharmacology. Is that the right word? Yeah, neuropsychopharmacology. Neuropsychopharmacology. <laughs> I know it's a bit of a mouthful. It's That's familiar for me, so familiar. it's easy. OK, so let's, let's, uh, let's do that one. Um, and uh, obviously, we've had some recent news coming from your, from your department uh, concerning um, breakthroughs in research using LSD yeah. and psychedelics in general. I think that's your field yeah. mostly of that's interest. Right. So um, perhaps you could start by just saying what's, what's, what's come through, what's new, what's sure. so exciting. Um, so the most recent stuff has been our brain imaging work with LSD using uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging and magnetoencephalography, mm -hmm. all the big words, <laughs> um, to essentially look at how LSD works in the brain. Um, so we're looking at LSD as a tool to perturb consciousness in a profound and novel way and then looking to um, glean based on um, how it alters consciousness, not just things about the nature of the LSD state but also the nature of the normal state that we've shifted the system from. Um, so it can have quite profound implications in telling us not just about LSD in the psychedelic state, as interesting, at least as far as I'm concerned, as interesting as that is, but also it's telling us about consciousness itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that begs the question, what does it tell us about consciousness itself? Yeah, so um, some of the main findings concern the nature of the communication patterns in the brain. And we see under LSD that there's um, much more of a, an open, um, freer uh, quality of communication across the brain. So in terms of the whole of the brain, um, so at a global level, uh, we're seeing an increase in global integration. That effect um, correlates with a particularly interesting aspect of the phenomenology, something that both um, drug users, psychedelic drug users, but also um, academics refer to as ego dissolution or ego disintegration, something which is quite abstract and, 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 um, and unusual and requires some unpacking, um, which I could do, but essentially it's the dissolution of that um, normally quite sort of pervasive, um, constant, reassuring perhaps uh, sense of self that we normally have. And so unusually, you know, and intriguingly, that seems to, to sort of dissolve away in the psychedelic state, yet wakefulness is preserved. So there's no loss of arousal. You're as awake as you ordinarily are. Um, there's no loss of consciousness on that level, yet consciousness is profoundly altered. So there's something about the quality of the consciousness that's profoundly altered, and we think it's it's uh, very related to this experience of, of uh, ego dissolution or the dissolving away of one sense of self. So the greater was this global integration in the brain, the greater was this ego dissolution experience according to people's ratings. Another thing that we could um, say about this global integration is that um, communities of brain regions that usually subserve quite specialized functions like visual processing, motor functioning, um, and then higher level things like attention. Ordinarily, they have a degree of uh, distinctiveness, separation if you want, segregation if you want. Um, and what we're seeing in the psychedelic state is a kind of desegregation. So it's a global integration and a global desegregation. There's more crosstalk, there's more blending going on across the brain. And that seems to relate to this, this um, experience of ego dissolution. And, and one thing that I've um, been developing and expanding on recently is the interesting overlap between this experience of ego dissolution and something that perhaps is, is maybe more familiar to people, despite it also being something quite rare, 
uh, which is the mystical or spiritual type experience. So something that you don't necessarily need drugs to achieve, um, but it, nevertheless it's not easy as well. And it might take, you know, a, some kind of spiritual retreat um, and some, you know, concerted, um, focused um, meditation perhaps to achieve that, that level. But what characterizes that mystical or, or spiritual experience is a, is a sense of the, the self dissolving away, but with that, um, a sense of connection with things. So perhaps a deeper connection with deeper aspects of, of yourself, um, a connection with others, and a connection with the universe at large, really. So in a way, just to wrap up, um, is it fair to say, it seems reasonable, um, certainly to me, and by the sound of it to you, to say, in a way, as humans, we've always been playing with consciousness. I think it seems to be built in. We're curious about it. We, we explore it. We, you know, we do all sorts of things to modify it, to change our experience. We seem to love it. It doesn't seem, no amount of making things illegal seems to really change that. Um, it's perhaps built in. Um, you know, going to see a movie is changing your consciousness in a way. It's uh, watching television maybe taking LSD. Um, maybe going to church. Maybe going to church, exactly. So in a way, uh, it, it, there's something very familiar to us about this. And, and uh, I think the forces that you get pitched against you, or that perhaps you're talking about, are in fear of that thing. Uh, it feels as if what they're doing is that it, they're really talking about themselves more than the world. It's like, I'm afraid of it, and therefore none of you are going to have that too. Yes, I, um, I, think, so, yeah. I think that's very true. and. Um, I think one reason why psychedelics are so ripe for both this fear and the sensationalism is that there's so much of this unknown. You know, the very nature of these compounds is to reveal the depths of the mind. And what's more scary than that, you know, alcohol is friendly to us to an extent because it, it's sort of dampening and it gives us a kind of sloppy sort of, you know, giddiness or whatever, which is fun and it's a social lubricant and such like, but psychedelics are mind revealing, you know, that's pretty scary. And so I think it is a fear of the unknown that, that sort of um, fuels uh, some of that, that opposition and conservatism. Excellent. And with that, Robin, thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts with us this afternoon. It's really good. Pleasure. Uh, good, good luck with it all. We thank wanna, you. We hope it will all succeed. So, Robin Carhart Harris. <laughs>13 protofilaments, eight spiraling one way, five spiraling the other, which means that they are Fibonacci numbers. Anytime you have two adjacent Fibonacci numbers, you have an approximation to the golden ratio. 13 is to eight, eight is to five. Not only that, and Roger Penrose asked the question, why are, are uh, why are the microtubules in Fibonacci numbers? And what happens is when you d have a double microtubule, you might think you'd have 26 filaments. No, it goes to 21. It goes to the next octave. Yeah. So again, it's all golden ratios resonating. And at the tips of the microtubules are clathrins. Here are the clathrins. They're buckyballs. They're truncated oh. icosahedra. If you take an edge, and that's one, and you go across to the other side, it's exactly a multiple of three golden ratios, exactly. So what's happening is when people, and these are at the synaptic cleft, so when people meditate or are communing with others, telepathy, whatever it is, or the, the Siddhartha sits under the bow tree, he goes into quantum coherence, he goes into resonance. The whole body is a resonance. It, so it's not just the microtubules, it's the bodily structure as well. This is a golden calipers. So it's cut so that that to that is in the golden ratio. The bone structure, if I take and I measure the, 
the uh, distal phalange, and it's the bones, it's not the flesh. If I flip this over now, I should be able to get the medial phalange, yes? If I flip it over now and I do the medial phalange, flip it over, I get the proximal phalange, which is the sum of the previous two. So that is how resonance works in nature. That is how we go into these non-ordinary states of consciousness. I do it in the, in the rainforest all the time. So, and I was taken out of my body and shown how this works when I was in isolation in the rainforest in Peru. So this is called the biofield anatomy hypothesis. And I'll just go through the bullet points really quickly. So the biofield is also called the human energy field or the aura. Like those are the non-scientific terms. Yeah. It's a diffuse magnetic field that surrounds the body. Um, it's bounded by a double layer plasma membrane. So that, like a skin of an orange, or we could say that it's um, the same as the magnetosphere of the earth or the heliosphere of the sun. Uh, the heart is the anode that generates the electric current. And then this is the cathode. So that's how the, it works electrically. So what's really radical about my work is that I found that instead of our memories being stored in our brain, that they're actually stored in standing waves in this biomagnetic field, that they're binarily encoded. What is and binarily? So well, I don't want to bind. It's binary. Binary, binary. codes. Yeah, binary coding. So these waves may inform and be informed by the microtubules that everybody's talking about here. <laughs> the hot new thing. Yes. Get yours now. At, uh... <laughs> uh, so I see the microtubules as antenna, which are broadcasting and, trans and receiving this information. Okay. Um, so there is a specific anatomy and physiology to this field that I've actually mapped. So I've spent the last 20 years bouncing sound like sonar off this atmosphere and listening to the sound that comes back. And I've discovered that there's a pattern that's universal in everyone. So every time you feel sad and you generate the frequency signature of sadness, it gets stored in here. And you've measured these things. I, well, subjectively with my human instrument. Yeah. Not objectively with instrumentation yet. Okay. Okay. So what, how does the tuning fork factor into it? So the tuning fork is, um, it's like sonar. It generates a signal and it, and it intersects. So the body is emanating these waves and the tuning fork is emanating waves and the waves intersect. And in that intersection, the tone of the tuning fork will actually change. So when we get into a memory that was traumatic, let's say, you know, your mom died when you were young, there will be an area of like a lot of chaos and static in that particular area. So the tuning forks find these areas of static and resistance in your biomagnetic field, but then they actually support the body in becoming self-aware and auto-correcting itself. This is Mark, the guy behind the tennis-centric tennis thing. Here he is with his poster. Hi, um, Dorian. Yeah, so this poster is uh, gives you the aesthetic feel of the paper. It's entitled Improvisational Subjective Induction. So if you look at it, uh, it should induce the actual theory itself. Uh, it suggests that uh, uh, it uses the language of constraining synergies to describe how uh, consciousness uh, attunes criticality to uh, uh, create bio um, uh, intelligent mechanosensing structures that enable it to propagate scale and um, and then it, it creates a language uh, improvisational subjective induction creates a language to describe how uh, a tennis player for example can uh, um, hit the tennis ball and uh, uh, with this aesthetic feel that is basically uh, being processed at the quantum scale um, and it points to the disassociation of the cortical hubs to uh, create criticality in, in the whole system. Um, as you get with improvisational jazz players, for example. Um, so you, you see this principle working at a macro scale as well as the quantum scale. Okay. And so it's the, re the explanatory power is in the reach of the language. So it goes from you know, the, the, the fine scale to the macro scale. And it also describes the uh, how inner feel uh, consciousness is a dual aspect, and how inner feel arises out of a quorum um, through uh, trajectories within the tubulin to create um, 
this uh, to emerge as this coherent self-awareness at the level of pyramidal ne neurons. But uh, so it draw it's it's a basically a consolidation of theories and sets of ideas to arrive at uh, you know an explanation for how a tennis player can hit the ball. Cool. I certainly like that. Will this make me better at tennis? I don't know, but <laughs> well, you're a musician, right? So it, <laughs> yeah, it would yeah. suggest you know it's like an improvisational music mm -hmm. that you know you 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 disassociate the sense of self to improvise, you know, and so so with jazz musicians, yeah, it points to, to feel yeah. the in, inner structure of whatever right. you're exploring, music well, or the physics right. of you the ball. On, you turn off the self-monitoring and then you're kind of an observer in your body and then, and then this induction, this creative induction is occurring from, um, uh, you know, from, from this intelligence within and my, my, I'm saying that when you capitulate to the aesthetic feel, you're going to that quantum state. That's cool. Thank you, Mark. I'd like to welcome my next guest, Selene Atasoy. She is at the University of Pompeii Favre in Barcelona, and her field of study and specialty is in computational neuroscience. So we're going to find out all about that. Welcome, Selene. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for so, inviting me. Um, so let's take those two words and work out what you're doing. Uh, yeah, we are trying to build, um, in a way, models that could explain or describe or even predict um, some things about the neural activity. And it was my personal interest to begin with uh, consciousness, but now I ended up in the exact um, right place, I believe. Um, so we are working on neural data uh, looking at fMRI, MEG, and also combining it with computational models to learn something more about the brain itself, the brain's dynamics, and how they change in consciousness and loss of consciousness. How do you quantify neural activity? So what we mostly look at is the, um, the dynamical changes that you find in functional magnetic resonance imaging, or MEG, it's a new technique which actually measures the magnetic fields around your head. And um, so there are various differences in, in both types of imaging modalities when you lose consciousness. So this is what we mostly look at. Yes, could you explain the second one again? Sorry, how does that work? So that's, um, I mean, EEG is probably better known, yeah. which measures the electric field around the, around the brain, let's say. And MEG would be the, uh, the measuring the magnetic field. So you, mm -hmm. would, cha you would measure the changes in the magnetic field um, while you're either performing a task or resting, which is what we are looking at. So it's kind of spontaneous neural activity, meaning that you're not doing anything and we're looking at your brain. And then we compare it to different stages of sleep. I think for some people, um, discovering that you can measure magnetic changes in the brain might be something new. Is this? It is that new. is a it is new. yeah, relatively new technology. I mean, it's yes, it's um, and it gives you better spatial and temporal resolution, meaning that you have a better idea of how the signal changes over time, and you can measure it at, um, more densely over the scalp. One of the problems I think that I've had explained to me in the past is, you know, all of these measurement um, techniques, fMRI is very useful and mm -hmm. we've learned a lot from it, but it, it only really, it, it's a very crude measure in a way, it's not a fine measure. Yeah, it, it, yes, exactly. I mean, first, temporally, the resolution that you have, it's is like in seconds, milliseconds, seconds range. And uh, you're actually measuring the blood flow, the oxygen level changes in the blood flow which is related to neural activity, but you're not actually measuring the neural activity itself. So it's the kind of indirect measure of neural activity. So can you say that, can you measure for consciousness? You know, with David Chalmers, the philosopher here, I'm sure yeah. you know, he, a few years ago he said, well, here's this consciousness meter, and it, it sort of was a hairdryer, and he's sort of pointing yeah. it at people. And That's he, the dream, he isn't said, it? "Well, we can't. It, it, you know, consciousness is this ineffable thing. You can. How do you measure for it? Are you able to measure?" For no, it? I mean, I I would like to be very clear on that. Actually, it's uh, one thing that I try to be very careful when I talk about these type of measures or about consciousness, because 
anything we measure is actually correlation. So we can measure neural activity and when, then we can relate it to what we observe. So what happens to the person? The person is in this stage of the sleep and we are measuring this type of activity. It's, um, it would be kind of um, more mainstream point of view to assume, okay, this neural activity is causing uh, this type of behavior or this type of state of consciousness. But if we really want to be precise, we don't, we are not measuring anything causal yet at this stage. Especially, I mean, when I look at fMRI or MEG data, I'm looking at the correlations, so neural correlates of consciousness. So consciousness meter, I mean, it's, I think it's very, very useful if you can detect signs of consciousness. For example, in vegetative state patients or um, in cases where you are not certain if the person is actually conscious or not. And if you have a signature of consciousness that you know exists in other people who you are sure are conscious, if you find that signature in the neural activity of these people, then it's great that you're able to say, okay, wait a minute, this person is very likely to be conscious. But the opposite, I would be very careful. So, you know, if you don't have that signature, I don't think we have one-to-one -one relationship. We haven't figured it out yet. Because if you, I mean, evidence of absence is not the same thing as absence of evidence. So if you don't find that signature yet, that does not mean that that person may not be conscious, you know. It's said, um, certainly by people like Stuart Hameroff, and I'm sure many, many people working in neuroscience and conscious field of consciousness, that the more you look at this thing, the brain, this mm -hmm. organ, the more you examine it and the deeper you go into it, the more ama amazing it yeah. is. Uh, I wonder, as a scientist, do you sort of, are you struck with this feeling of awe that, oh, wow, what is this yeah, thing? It, it, it's it incredible, happens. Isn't These it? moments yeah. of like, no way, <laughs> seriously. No, it did happen also during this work, or there have been times where I was just reading about it and, you know, some things that, but I think that. That moments happen um, either when you're extremely surprised or you're like, wow, you know, this, it, it seems to, it seems to be highly complex. Yeah, I agree. Like, I'm not definitely belittling the complexity of the human brain, but it seems to be also built in a way that is so efficient and, you know, there is an elegance of simplicity. And sometimes you, you see that in many biological forms, including the brain as, I mean, this is what I, uh, I'm most struck by. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much thank for coming you. this afternoon. Yeah, thanks for inviting And that is Selene Atasoy. <laughs>
So constraints evolve to regulate cells from the inside. Transmissions of information extrinsic to the medium from the mind of Terence Deacon to the cytoplasm. From the mind of Terence Deacon to the cytoplasm of a paramecium. Paramecium and medium, right? Yeah. A spontaneous molecular tessellation adapting to environmental conditions using stereochemical matching. Tessellation, a molecular interlocking network of nucleotides and lipids reminiscent of M.C. Escher. Of course, nothing as complex as Terence Deacon had yet evolved. Just a vegetative sentience wrapped in the cell's walls. But even a vegetative sentience has basic affects and the ability to express its emergence and attractions thanks to the molecules of emotion. The simplest cells can actually feel. It gives rise to the emotion emotional vitalism of Catherine Peel. The enlightenment rejection of vitalism left Catherine feeling negative, so she brought it back as enlivenment and subjectively resurrected it. Over the years, our basic attractions and aversions have evolved into higher sentience, including ethical virtues, although I do admit to feeling a bit skeptical, actually, because her list of biologically based virtues strangely included chastity. I guess the celebration of sexual freedom isn't the rule when a theory is formulated at Harvard Divinity School. And how do we get to consciousness from just the molecular soup inside a single cell? Our hero, Stuart, comes to the rescue. Yeah, she said, our hero, Stuart, comes to the rescue. We're saved. But wait, is it just me, or is that the kind of phrase that was heard less often on a Tucson stage back when this conference was co-organized by Dave? Anyways, these basic emotional states animals feel go from angry to chill, from Hillary to Trump to Catherine Peel, and the challenge is still to be more like bonobos and less like chimps, although random sex, that's still a no-no. Catherine's emotional vitalism can provide answers, even when your fiancé leaves you for someone whose father is dying of cancer and your uncle is suffering from PTSD, which sends you on a quest to overdose him with ecstasy, which means this is a theory with practical applications, guiding the evolution of life through infinite adaptations, from paramecium through fish, reptiles, and finally rodents, from Anthony Houdet's. He loads up the rodents with massive anesthetic doses. Even the quantum superpositions explored by Calvin McQueen are no match for Tony with a tank of isofluorine. A rat with a mac microscopic array having a conscious experience reveals a dynamic clustering pattern of spiking neuronal sequences. What a relief. He was the first person all day to say that neurons are relevant and have a role to play. The pattern of interaction between them are sparse and disconnected compared to awake states when they're subjected to anesthetic. That's what I'm talking about. Neurons interacting. Let's get it cracking. Time for Georgie Busaki on mental mapping. The nerve cells in your brain specifically map the physical space, which gives us a framework to explore future and present states. I, I can't say that much about neutrophil substrates or superfluids transforming to gases and back in a quantum wave. I, I just feel happy, a happy affect when neurons interact, even if there's more to it than that. It's no shade to Henry Stapp. It's no shade to teledendrons arrayed in a, wet, arrayed in a web of energy or holonomic brain theory with its holistic symmetry. I don't know if it really is dendrites, dendrites, dendrites. I just know I wish I could have had more of Carl and Walter's insights. In the evolution of life, from the Big Bang to the highest sentience, I'll put Carl Friedman and Walter Friedman at the head of it, as Karen Shannon carries the banner and the torch is passed on. I will always keep their memory in my axons, axons, axons. <laughs> Once again, time to find out what's been going on at the plenaries. And of course, today is the final day of the conference. Uh, and it's also a very busy day for the plenaries. I think a lot of presentations. Uh, Cameron, of course, has been sitting through it all, listening, absorbing, turning it into his legendary five-minute presentation. Cameron, <laughs> what happened? 
Uh, it had a lot going on in this last phase of the conference. Um, to, to start with, though, there was a session uh, honoring the memory of Carl Prebrum and Walter Freeman, yeah. uh, two great um, scientists that uh, died in the past year, and Walter Freeman um, sadly passed away just uh, days before the conference started here uh, and was scheduled to speak about uh, Carl Prebrum's life. And so we had um, Henry Stapp and Karen Shainer uh, came and delivered the lectures that um, Walter Freeman had planned to deliver um, and talked about the life of Prebrum, who was a, a sort of uh, huge mind, published 700 articles and books on different aspects of the brain and behavior and uh, even psychiatry. And Freeman, similarly, uh, who was a student of Prebrum's, uh, just published all over the place, did you know things in so many different areas of science. Uh, so um, Henry Stapp talked about Freeman's latest work with um, Giuseppe Vitiello, um, which is bringing like quantum field theory and applying it to um, how the brain might be working to produce consciousness. Um, and so they talked about how there's this clash between the standard neuron doctrine about um, action potentials, sort of like wires, um, uh, Karen called them, it's like telephone wires versus a sort of wireless view of how the brain might be working. So they talked about these structures in the brain that might be able to mediate this um, more sort of like quantum dynamics inside of the brain. So uh, several of the uh, speakers in the last few days have been uh, bringing various quantum approaches to biology. So it's definitely over the years you see more and more variation on this theme of that quantum biology is somehow very relevant and quantum physics very relevant to um, describing how the brain really works. So a lot of great scientists starting to sort of come into that point of view. Um, so uh, after that we had um, Georgi Bushaki, who is uh, another one of these great sort of titans of uh, brain science and he talked about the link between um, action, sort of like spatial navigation, you know, animals, uh, the pri one of the primary things that they do is uh, apparently to just figure out where their body is, what's the shape of my body, where's the, um, how to sense the environment and so he talked about the brain structures that allow that stuff to happen where like tracking where the, where the head is moving um, and basic things like uh, when, when, a, uh, when a fetus uh, is, or an embryo is developing the kicking that to say like a mother when, when she's pregnant if the baby starts kicking apparently that's some sort of like a random or stochastic process that the that the happens in the brain and it connects the the inf, you know the really the developing brain to the muscular and skeletal system and so Bushaki was saying that that basic process is like one of the ways that uh, babies use to figure out what's the shape and the size of their body and what kind of a world do they live in and so when they're born that process once their brain gets a little more complex they start doing that in their <coughs> in, they start doing that in their dreams so we still kick and twitch in our dreams so um, so we talked about how those basic navigational systems then become internalized and that becomes the basis of like episodic memory and all of these um, long-term memories that we have about where where our bodies were in the past and we can project ourselves into the future to to help try to predict the future for you know to increase our ability to survive. So uh, his talk was fascinating. Um, we had uh, Alison Gopnik uh, from UC Berkeley who studies children um, and the minds of children. What's it, she wants to know what's it like to be a four-year-old. And uh, it turns out apparently that um, if, if instead of uh, taking psychedelics and doing all these things, all you need to do is have tea with a four-year-old, she says, and you'll see what it is uh, to have an expanded consciousness because children have this capacity for exploration and thinking up really exotic um, stories about um, about the world and so she she tied the the way that children children's brains behave to like for example the way that a jazz musician improvises where they sort of shut down they're able to focus very intently but they're able to shut down some of these um, more cognitive parts of the brain and just uh, um, do this um, uncanny ex exploration. Um, so uh, we, several of the people that I, I, I know you're going to be interviewing also spoke in the plenary. So Stuart Kaufman and Catherine Peel and uh, um, 
Dr. Harris, who studies um, the, uh, the psychedelics research. Um, so that was all very exciting. Um, and to finish the, uh, the conference, we had Dean Radin, uh, and he talked about a series of experiments um, for pilot studies where it's, he's taking that uh, famous double slit experiment where you, you have a stream of photons and they go through, they have two different options for, to go through these little apertures. And in quantum theory, they go through both of the apertures at once somehow. But then when there's some sort of collapse, then they, they choose one or the other slit. So they set up one of those double slit experiments in a little detector. And the twist is that he put a meditator or a, you know, uh, someone sitting just a few meters away from the double slit device and told them to focus on the, a, a task of influencing the outcome of this double slit experiment. And then they would have people that weren't meditators try and do the same thing. And then for, as a control, they, would, uh, they developed a computer program and, a, and an online kind of experimental environment where a computer program would be sort of, sort of trying to influence. Or, uh, and so they, they did a series of studies and found that the meditators that were concentrating were able to, um, the results of the double slit experiment were not sort of 50-50 as you would expect, but they, had, they seemed to have some statistically significant impact on the outcome of this double slit experiment. So they replicated the experiments over and over again in, uh, in different ways uh, over a period of several years and um, sent the data to, and even the devices to, be, to replicate the experiments to other laboratories apparently. And similarly, the other laboratories are finding exotic kinds of effects and so they're trying to figure out what, uh, over time, if they, can, if they can verify these things, what impact might it have on thinking about um, the causal framework there, whether it's some kind of quantum thing and what does it say about uh, what, uh, what the role of consciousness is in the, in the universe. So all of these talks were fascinating. Um, I can't wait to come back uh, in the years to come and see what, what else people have dreamed up. So Again, a wonderful uh, summary. Um, thank you so much for all your work this week. You've done a great job and obviously going roving around with the microphone and talking to people as well. And thank you for doing all this hard work. I mean, this show would not happen <laughs> without the tireless work of this gentleman here. Well, so. thank you very much, Cameron. We thank each other. A wonderful thing. <laughs>
into zombies. <laughs> it's a massive experiment on zombification. So right now it's Saturday afternoon, and I feel that my consciousness is, ebbing, is dwindling. Ebbing, and, it's ebbing yeah, away, yeah. definitely. But no, it's been a great time. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything that stood out for you, something that maybe surprised you this week? Well, there were about six sessions on quantum mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out why that might be. Uh, as Baba <laughs> said, it's insider trading. <laughs> Well, you know, let me, let me address that. I, you know, it's true that uh, I've been pushing for the quantum approach, not just the quantum approach, but the interneuronal approach. I mean, all the other theories that we heard about, global workspace, uh, IIT, higher order thought, predictive coding, and others are all neural level. They, they treat neurons as, as simple bits on off states. The brain's a computer. And don't consider the fact that uh, neurons are alive. The brain is, is, is a biological system. And what does that mean? And I've always thought that you need to go uh, a, consider what it means to be alive. B, go inside the neuron, and the inf information processing in the cytoskeleton, at least the capacity is enormous, and now there's more and more evidence that it's playing a, a key role. And then you get into the quantum effects, which allow a, uh, a, a connection to the universe and a, uh, a chance to solve the hard problems. So that's why I've been pushing that agenda, and it's true, I've been, uh, been angling over the years to get some of that in, and now uh, a little bit more of it in, but it's not, it's not totally insider trading. I think, it's, I think it's warranted. I think a lot of people are coming there. Even Dave has come over the, to the quantum side, is in the quantum camp, although he, he's still a bit vague about it, but uh, it's good to have you on board, Dave. Thanks. Yeah, well, I guess my line on this stuff is that you know, linking quantum mechanics and consciousness is important, and it's a promising approach, and I'm actually interested in it myself but it should not be the whole conference. And, uh, oh, you know, come on, it the wasn't the whole conference. The 10 conferences or so that Stu and I co-organized, we did say, okay, let's have a session on quantum mechanics or maybe a session and a half, but... Uh, well, that's where know, we didn't uh, make Where is progress. the mainstream psychology? Where is the mainstream philosophy? It's like, okay. So, I mean, I think a little bit of, maybe a little bit of balance could be good. I, well, okay. And you was, have, were there yeah. fewer philosophers here this time, markedly less than... than there were fewer. There's unquestionably fewer. fewer than in previous times, and it might right. have something to do with the amount of philosophy on the, uh, on the program. So I'm a philosopher, I'd like to see more philosophers here. I'd like to see more psychologists here. There's almost no psychology on the program. Fair amount of neuroscience, although it kind of skewed in Stu's direction. I'm not saying it's uninteresting or important, but I'm saying it's pretty, I think it's important for the conference to, to cater to you know, a very wide variety of, of approaches. I think uh, that direction uh, is making the most progress and holds the most promise. So I'm, uh, I'm not defensive about it. From the first person perspective, yeah. everything looks like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to admit, okay, so uh, my approach can't explain, unlike other approach, memory, uh, language, uh, origin of life, evolution, and even uh, non locality spirituality, and uh, solve the hard problem in principle. How about hair loss? Uh, that we're working on. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think that over the last year since we were in Helsinki or even before a couple of years ago here that things have moved in your direction a bit more? Are you I feeling so. that happening? Yeah, yeah? definitely, definitely. Yeah. I feel like the organization of the conference has definitely moved in <laughs> this direction. No, I think the whole field has. In fact, there's a, a writer here from uh, Discover Magazine who wrote an article about my work uh, six years ago. And at the time he wrote that these, these are really interesting, promising things, but everybody ridicules and nobody takes it seriously. Since that time, there's been really a pretty, pretty good groundswell of quantum biology and, and uh, new developments in, uh, in microtubule uh, biology, effects of anesthesia now seem to work on, uh, on microtubules. So I think it, it is moving in that direction. He's back here interviewing people. And uh, the basic uh, gist of his article now is uh, uh, Stuart Hamroff's looking pretty good right now. And uh, that may even be the title of his article. I, Dave dissented, I guess, when he interviewed him. But uh, most other people agree that that's the case. The brain is not a computer as much as it is an orchestra. Consciousness is more like music than a competition. That's a good thing for a t-shirt. Anything for a t-shirt, Dave? T-shirts. Yeah, a, a slogan you can put that describes the universe, such as Stuart's. See, we're, we're one up on him. I know, I know, uh, I know. <laughs> okay, wait, here it comes. <laughs> He's not giving up. Last time you said it's the annoying time between naps. That, that's legendary, of course. Lately, I've been thinking that consciousness is, uh, you know, I've been entertaining the idea that we're in a virtual reality, so we might be living in a, uh, a simulation. But then the question is, if we're living in a simulation, it's like, well, maybe we're living in a simulation within a simulation, or a simulation within a simulation within a simulation. Statistically, they might just expand as every level goes down. You know, so so th then the deepest question of our position in the universe is what level of simulation are we in? And I think I've figured out the answer. We're at level 42. <laughs> <laughs> That's from that movie. That's yeah. as ridiculous as the multiverse and the multiple worlds idea. And Popular, but totally wrong in my opinion. Just ahead of its time. <laughs> <laughs> We're ahead of our time.
No, you're behind your time. No, we're ahead. Everybody, <laughs> even you're catching up with us now by uh, joining the quantum camp. Uh, but you haven't, uh, you know, without the biology, without the physics, without the proper physics, uh, we're going to stay ahead of you. But good uh, luck. So I think uh, let, let's check back in 2100. Okay, All sounds right. good. Okay, and with that, I'd like to thank you, Dave Chalmers, Stuart Hammeroff. Thanks very much for our little roundtable chat here. Quite uh, interesting and <laughs> with some sparks flying. And uh, we'll be Peace back out. later. Peace out. <laughs>
So that just about wraps it for another year here at the Science of Consciousness Conference 2016 and Consciousness Central. And I just want to say thank you to some of the people who've made this program possible. I'd like to thank Cameron Keyes for his amazing wrap-ups from the uh, plenary sessions. Dorian Electra for her sparkling encounters with people around the conference. And of course, Baba Brinkman for his daily wrap-up. And then there's our wonderful crew, behind the scenes guys, our international coordinator over in Stuttgart, Sasha Seifert, and Jason Canfield, our set production sound and camera wizard, and Nikolai Cranium, who is in fact standing on the other side of this very camera. I want to say a big thank you to Stuart Hameroff, organizer, founder of uh, Toward the Science of Consciousness Conference, now the Science of Consciousness Conference, and uh, Director of the Centre for Consciousness Studies here in Tucson, and of course the most amazing Abby Bihar Montefiore for keeping it all together, keeping the universe from flying away into multiple parts. I'm Nick Day, I want to say thank you to you guys for watching. We wish you all the very best, stay conscious. This is the end of our show, we'll see you again hopefully next year from wherever TSC comes from. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>